Dear Church, let's talk about celebrating religious holidays. Hello and welcome to the Dear Church Podcast. I'm your host, Chris McCurley. Excited to have my good friend, Wes McAdams, with us once again. Wes, you're an old regular at this. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, brother. Yes, and so we're talking today about a topic that uh, seems to come up quite a bit this time of year, and it's you know Christians celebrating religious holidays. And this is not a topic that is relegated to churches of Christ. There are other, there are other uh, uh, churches that uh, debate this topic that have long taken a stand for or against on this topic. And so today I just wanted to kind of discuss with you some of the, um, just the talking points and also maybe come to some sort of uh, conclusions that um, hopefully will maybe expose the maybe some error in the way that we've thought about this in the past, but also, um, maybe shedding some new light on this, if that makes sense. Um, so I wanted to start with some of the myths concerning certain holidays and the roots of certain holidays, because one of the things that you hear quite often when we discuss whether Christians should be celebrating uh, religious holidays is, you, you know, they, they have roots in paganism, right? It seems like every holiday that's brought up, well, it's, it, they're, it's rooted in paganism, which is not completely true, uh, with all holidays, but even if it is true, does that make it to where we have to avoid it at all costs today? Talk a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Yeah, and I, I guess I'd start by saying that if, if because of a connection that is either real or perceived to a pagan practice or paganism, if that makes somebody uncomfortable, if it violates their conscience, then then I would say don't you know don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants to force anybody to do something that might violate their conscience. And so if somebody feels like, hey, having a Christmas tree might might be tied to some sort of tree worship, or you know this might have some pagan roots or pagan roots here or there with the day or the holiday or the the specific practices, then I would say, you know, if it makes you uncomfortable, don't do it. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but but I think that we we have to talk a little bit more about sort of the evolution of things. And we sort of oversimplify, as you said, um, there's some myths about how these things developed and how they evolved over time. I mean, the truth is, if you read any about the development of any holiday, whether it's Halloween or Easter or Christmas or whatever, there has been huge evolutions of these days and practices over time. Sort of what what that practice or that holiday or that celebration looks like over time has changed. Some of it because of culture, some of it because of consumerism, mm -hmm. some of it because of the religious influences, different churches, different traditions that have influenced it over time. So whether we're talking about Christmas or Easter or whatever, there's a complicated history behind it. And to just sort of oversimplify it and say, well, this is paganistic or this has pagan roots, mm, that's just oversimplifying things. And, and then there's the, the, the aspect of consistency. And I think if we're going to say that Christians should reject anything that has pagan roots, yeah, we're really getting into dangerous territory there because even the days of the week, and I like to remind people that every single day of our week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, all of those days, have their, the words are actually from pagan mythology. Absolutely. And so, so, so if we're going to say we're going to reject anything that has pagan roots— then you got to use different names of the week. You have to use uh, different names for the months. All of these things are, are rooted in paganism. And so for consistency's sake, we got to be really careful when we say that. Um, but, but then I think to take it one step further is that Paul actually redeemed things from the pagan world. I'm, I'm thinking about um, his sermon at, at, on Mars Hill yeah. uh, in Athens, and he, he actually quotes from pagan poets, and he draws in things from the culture and uses those as a vehicle to communicate the truth about Jesus. Sure. And so even if these holidays do have, and, and again, they have a complicated history, and and even if we pick this day because of this holiday or that holiday that was celebrated in paganism, but then we we sort of robbed the pagan temples of their treasures and we redeemed those things to communicate to culture about Jesus, 
that actually has a, a precedent in Scripture that's an apostolic practice to rob the pagans of their days and their celebrations and redeem those days for Jesus and to use those things as a vehicle to communicate about Jesus. So yeah. again, I, I think for consistency, we have to be really careful to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do away with anything that has roots in paganism. But also, I think we have to acknowledge the, the apostolic precedent of using things that are found in the non-believing culture to communicate about Christ. Oh, absolutely. The consistency thing is something that I noticed many years ago with a church that um, they were adamantly opposed to any sort of semblance of Christmas uh, on the church grounds or Easter, yet they had once a month um, birthday celebrations you know, for all the folks that had a birthday here in that month, not realizing that birthday celebrations have roots in paganism as well. Yep. And so it is hard to remain consistent there. And I, I would also see if you agree with this, but you know, when my children were younger and they dressed up for Halloween as their favorite superhero or, or a princess or whoever, and went door to door trick or treating, they saw that as an opportunity to do just that, to dress up and go get candy. They didn't see that as a demonic holiday or Satan worship. And so, like you said, holidays change over time, the meaning changes over time, and just because it meant one thing hundreds or thousands of years ago doesn't mean that it has to mean that for us today. And I love what you said about redeeming them. That is my approach as well. Um, you know, this time of year, I, I, I'm doing a sermon series on uh, the, the birth of Jesus. I know you're preaching uh, somewhat similar to that. Uh, talk a little bit about that, redeeming those holidays in the church and using that as an opportunity to speak about Jesus when, you know, the world is at least paying attention to him somewhat, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's it's a tremendous opportunity. In fact, I, I think that, that sometimes we we squander that opportunity and even— you know, we could we could lament and sort of wring our hands about the people that only come to church on Christmas and Easter and and say people shouldn't do that. But the fact of the matter is they're at least coming on Christmas and Easter. Right. And if they show up at Christmas and Easter um, and they're they're looking for hope and they're looking for hope in the right place, they're looking for hope in the gospel. And so we ought to use that opportunity to say, here, let me show you about Jesus and let me encourage you to commit your entire life to Jesus. It's a, it's a tremendous opportunity to, to take where people are and what people are thinking about. Again, it's, it's interesting how some churches will use other types of cultural bridges to take the opportunity to say, hey, people are thinking about this, and here's sort of a connection point from this to Jesus. Right. But but these are opportunities where people are already thinking about Jesus. It isn't just that we have some similarity type of a, a, a point of reference where we can draw a connection. It's that they're, they're thinking and talking about Jesus. I was at uh, Six Flags with my son the other day, and they had decorated for Christmas, and, and they were playing songs. And I was amazed at how many of them were actually Christmas carols. They weren't just mm -hmm. holiday songs. They weren't just about being merry and jolly, but they were about Jesus. I was hearing the name of Jesus played over the speakers. And yeah. I thought, what an amazing thing that here we are in a, in a secular entertainment venue and, and the name of Jesus is being proclaimed as the king of the world, as the savior of right. the world. What an amazing opportunity for those of us who also believe in Jesus to use that and, and connect with people about Jesus at this time of year. Yeah, and you have that, but yet in some of our churches, the Sunday closest to Christmas is a Jesus free day. You know, we can yeah. talk about Jesus every other day of the year, except the one closest to Christmas. And isn't that unfortunate? Because while I don't believe that you are wrong, Obviously, if your conscience doesn't allow you to celebrate a certain day or whatever, I, you know, you said that at the beginning. Uh, I don't think you're wrong and 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 you know, following your conscience there. I do think it's wrong to not talk about Jesus. You know, uh, to purposely avoid Jesus, I think is always wrong. Talk a little bit about how Romans 14 fits into this discussion because I, I think Paul has a lot to say to us about certain feast days and certain holy days in that context. Yeah. And and, and obviously, I, I think sometimes we, 
we want to overemphasize the context, and sometimes we, we try to de-emphasize the sure. context. Uh, so, so setting it up in the context, I mean, Paul obviously throughout his ministry, and especially in Romans, is concerned with the Jews and the Gentiles being one family yes. and, and living as one family, accepting one another, welcoming one another. And in Romans 14 especially, he's telling them not to judge each other or condemn each other over their opinions. And, and when Paul uses the word that we translate as opinions, he doesn't mean like blue is the best color or pepperoni is the best pizza. Yeah. It's not opinions like that. It's the, the Greek word is dialogismos, which is a conclusion. It's a reasoning that you've come to. And so these are people that have come to well-reasoned conclusions. The thing is that they've come to different well-reasoned conclusions. It's a good point. And some of them have come to well-reasoned conclusions that they shouldn't celebrate specific days, and others have come to well-reasoned conclusions that they should celebrate these days. Yeah. It's probably the Jewish believers that are still recognizing and celebrating the Sabbath, the Passover, Hanukkah, whatever it was that they were celebrating these days and honoring the Lord on these days. Right. And Paul says, leave them alone. Don't <laughs> condemn them for doing that. But then also that those that are celebrating them shouldn't look down on those who abstain from celebrating them, because maybe the Gentile Christians had come to the well-reasoned conclusion that we're not under the law. We, we're not trying to be converted to Judaism. And, and so we're not going to recognize those days. But again, if we're going to make any application of what Paul says, I think it applies very well to what we're talking about, that if somebody has come to the well-reasoned conclusion that, that Jesus was raised from the dead on a specific Sunday, uh -huh. there was one specific Sunday on which Jesus was raised from the dead, and they come to the well-reasoned conclusion that that's the Sunday following Passover, then if they want to celebrate on that day, that that that's okay, and I shouldn't condemn them for doing so. Right. But also, if somebody else comes to the well-reasoned conclusion that, well, every Sunday we're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus, and, and I don't want to put one Sunday above the others, if that's their well-reasoned conclusion, then I shouldn't condemn them either. And so it's possible to come to well-reasoned conclusions about these different days. But Paul says, as long as you are celebrating or abstaining in honor of the Lord, then then leave each other alone and stop condemning each other and stop trying to force each other to do things your way. And I think this hits us right between the eyes, mm -hmm. sort of on both sides of it sometimes, of both sides of this conversation, but it certainly has application to what we're talking about. Absolutely. And I think one of the messages that you see in Paul's uh, uh, writing there is that somebody doesn't have to be wrong. You know, as it pertains to Romans 14, I, I think we believe that, that it's black and white. And I've heard people say that the Bible's just black and white. Well, it is in some cases. In other cases, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's very gray. And uh, in some cases, it doesn't land where we would like it to land necessarily in a conclusive stance. And, uh, and Paul is saying here, when it comes to these matters, I believe that uh, somebody doesn't have to be wrong. And uh, you have the right not to celebrate. You don't have the right to condemn others who do, and vice versa. Um, you know, there's something else that you you have written about on your blog, Radically Christian, and that I've heard you talk about before that I wanted you to elaborate on a little bit because you and I have, I mean, obviously, have the same uh, approach to this this topic, why I had you on here, but You've, you brought out something that I had not really thought about in the past, and that is how the Jews created a holiday. So we see this, I believe, in the book of Esther, the Feast of Purim. And you brought this out, and it really was eye-opening to me, and I'd like the others to hear about it. Because we always say, well, God didn't sanction the celebration of this or that within the church or wherever, you know, but, but they created a holiday, and God did not condemn it. In fact, God seemed to be okay with it, right? So talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I mean, God gave, sometimes we, we feel like we're standing on really solid ground when we say, if God gives specific instructions about something, then, then we don't have the liberty to do anything outside of those specific instructions. Right. Sounds like a, a fairly good argument, and it's certainly um, 
a, a circumspect type of an argument yeah. that we need to be very careful when we are presuming the authority to do this or that. Sure. But in, in the book of Esther, we find that here are a group of, of Jewish people who have the law, so they have the specific feasts and festivals and holy days that they are commanded by God to keep, yet we have biblical precedent for them creating an additional day to remember something that God has done. And so they they create the day of Purim to to celebrate what God has done in delivering them yet again. They don't say, well, hey, listen, we have the Passover. God told us to celebrate the Passover, but he he didn't tell us to celebrate this day. No, they said, okay, and, and they created it, and it was something that they continued to celebrate. Um, we have another example in Hanukkah yeah. in that, uh, or the Feast of, of Dedication, which happened during the inter- intertestamental period, the, the time of the Maccabees, and the temple had been taken over by the Greeks, it had been defiled, and then the, the temple was retaken, and it was rededicated to God. And then even in the in the gospel account of John, in John chapter 10, Jesus is there in the temple during the Feast of Dedication. Yep. And so John doesn't s- speak negatively about the fact that they, they had created an additional feast in addition to the ones that God had commanded, and Jesus seems to be keeping that feast and using that opportunity as an opportunity to teach about himself and his own ministry. Right. So I, I think that I, I agree with the principle that says we need to not go beyond what Scripture gives us the authority to do. But a very good case could be made that Scripture gives us the authority to create special days to honor the Lord at, at our at our will. When we can come to a well-reasoned conclusion that this would be a good time to remember what God has done in X, Y, and Z— There's a precedent for that. So I don't think we should do what we don't have biblical precedent for. But for this, we we do have biblical precedent for celebrating special days. Yeah, that's very true. And, and, And of course, the rub comes when we're talking about celebrating within the home versus celebrating within the church, because I I think most of our audience— is going to celebrate Christmas at home. They're going to open presents Christmas Eve night or Christmas morning. They're going to have a tree. They're going to do all the fanfare that comes with celebrating Christmas. But when we get into the church, absolutely not. No wreaths on the door, no trees, no nativity scene, nothing like that because that's a no-no. And what you're saying is, what I think I hear you saying is, I mean, there's at least a precedent for acknowledging you know, the birth of Jesus in a way that perhaps, you know, somewhat seems somewhat secular, but at the same time, you know, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily saying that, yes, he was born on uh, December 25th, and therefore that's what we are celebrating, and happy birthday, Jesus, that kind of thing. Um, That At the very least, we've got to be careful being too dogmatic one way or the other. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I think we've got to be careful on the one hand, that we don't compartmentalize our life, where we say, well, this activity is sinful when it's done as a group in this place, but it's it's good when it's done at home with this other group of people. We're Christians everywhere we yes. are, and so we have to be very careful that we're not over-compartmentalizing our life, and we're saying these activities that are fine over here are somehow sinful over there. That's that's a very dangerous road to go down. But at the other, on the other hand, I think with the Romans 14 issue, I try to be really careful that even though I I think that this is a great opportunity to to preach about the birth of Jesus and to help connect people with that story that we're a part of that the gospel invites us into, and this is a great opportunity to do that. But at the same time, I want to be sensitive and careful that there are a lot of people that have come from a religious background that makes it very hard for them to do that. And so it violates their conscience. And so when we do something as the church or in a group, sometimes we're we're actually forcing people to make a decision. And we don't want to violate Romans 14 on on either extreme of, of or either end of that discussion. And so I think sometimes when we do things as the church, we almost compel people to violate their conscience uh, when when they're uncomfortable with it. But at the same time, we have to allow that uh, allow the, the fact that we're going to come to different conclusions on things. So I, I think we have to avoid compartmentalizing where we say, hey, it's sinful at home or it's sinful at church, but it's not sinful at home. 
But I think we also have to avoid compelling people to participate in something that they might not be comfortable with. Yeah, it's the consistency issue that you talked about. Um, And I, I think also the key, and that was Paul's context, is keeping the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And so maybe there are a few in the church that that don't feel comfortable celebrating Christmas, and there are others that feel very comfortable or vice versa. And so you have to take that in consideration as well. And maybe it's just not profitable. Maybe it causes yeah. too many issues that we just say, you know what, we're, we're not going to go there. I think when we read through Romans 14, sometimes we look at it and we say, well, the weaker brother just needs to pick it up. You know, the weaker brother just needs to come around and, and be stronger. And uh, But, you know, the 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 lion's share of admonition was to the stronger brother, not the weaker one. You know, in other words, you know better, you know this stuff, so be careful how you react and, and act towards others. Um, so, Wes, talk a little bit about, um, you know, as far as not just Christmas, but but holidays in general. So we've got we've got Easter, which same kind of thing comes up. You know, of course, we're, we're a little bit clearer on Easter as far as the time and things of that nature. But I, I think all too often what happens is that we miss the point of this because we're spending too much time bickering over whether he was actually born on December the 25th or or whatever. You know, he was born. I mean, that's a biblical fact. He did die and rise again. That's a biblical fact. Talk about how if we're not careful, we can we can kind of miss what's most important in all this because we're too busy, you know, discussing all these different uh, what's the word peripheral issues. Yeah, that's so true. It's so true. I I like to compare it with um, uh, an anniversary. You know, people make the argument, well, you shouldn't celebrate these things one time a year. You should be celebrating them all year long. You shouldn't be celebrating uh, the birth of Jesus one time a year. You should be celebrating it all year long. You shouldn't celebrate the resurrection once a year, but all year long. And and to a degree, I I totally uh, believe that and agree with that and affirm that 100%. But it's like my anniversary. I, I celebrate my anniversary once a year, but I celebrate my marriage all year long. Right. And so th- those two ideas are not mutually exclusive. It's not mutually exclusive to say, well, you shouldn't celebrate your anniversary once a year because you should be celebrating your marriage all year long. It's like, well, can I do both? I- yeah. Is it possible to do both? Is it yeah. possible to have a day set aside where I celebrate when we got married? And and for that matter, you know, we got married in, in June, which was a horrible time for somebody in youth ministry at the time <laughs> to get married because we were always doing youth activities. Right. So we had to push our, our celebration to a different day. Does that change anything? Does it change anything about why we're celebrating, why we're taking this one day to go out to dinner and remember our wedding and remember the the commitment that we made to each other? Of course not. It, it doesn't matter what day it's on. It matters that we are taking this time to celebrate the actual marriage. But then all year long, we're also celebrating the fact that we're married and, <laughs> and we love each other. And the same is true and can be true with these holidays. It, it, it's not mutually exclusive. You either celebrate the resurrection once a year or you celebrate the resurrection all year long. You can you can actually do both. And I think it's good and fine for us to do both, for us to celebrate and think about the birth of Jesus but or the, or the resurrection of Jesus. But my wife commented yesterday after my sermon, I, I'm doing a series on, on the birth of Christ. And we talked yesterday about Joseph and how he might have felt when when he was when he saw the vision or or had the dream where he was told that Mary was pregnant and 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 with the child from the holy spirit and and we talked about his feelings and and what he might have experienced being um betrothed but being betrothed to a pregnant woman and and so that the the shame that might have come along with that and we talked about all of these things and my wife said you know we just didn't really grow up talking about the birth of Jesus because we didn't, he, she said, even if it was in April, we didn't want to give the impression that we were celebrating Christmas. <laughs> right. And so we, we, we tend sometimes to get so dogmatic about not being like the denominations or not being like other religious groups that we end up forgetting the story that we're a part of and celebrating who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. So I don't care if somebody celebrates it in December or in April, but 
let's talk about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And let's, let's sing these carols. Let's sing these songs of, of joy and remember what Jesus has done. Let's not be people that are just known for what we're against. Oh, well, we don't celebrate this and we don't celebrate that. But what we're for, that we are for Jesus and we are for celebrating the story of Jesus and what Jesus has done in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about that. You know, we're recording on a Monday. So Sunday morning, yesterday morning, I was sitting there and our song leader opened the service with joy to the world. He sang later in the service, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And uh, because I am too doing a sermon series on the birth of Jesus. And I'm sitting there listening to these songs and I'm thinking, okay, um, what if someone were to be a visitor and say, well, they're celebrating Christmas? Well, is that really the conclusion to reach? I mean, Joy to the World is absolutely a biblical-based song. I mean, there's nothing unscriptural about that song. Uh, in fact, could you really even say it's a Christmas song? I mean, you could sing that song any time of the year, and it'd be appropriate. O Come, O Come, Emmanuel's the same way. Absolutely a scriptural song, tells the biblical story of Jesus' birth. And, and, you know, I think we're just so ready to jump at, well, okay, so that means you believe that Jesus was born on December 25th. No, that's not what that means. We just want to celebrate his birth, and we want to do that at a time when uh, the culture around us is. But the culture around us is also commercializing him. And, you know, I've said this before, but Easter has become about eggs and bunnies and Christmas has become about flying reindeer and Santa Claus, which is all fine and good. I mean, that's that's great as long as it doesn't take center stage and we don't miss the headline. And the headline is at this time of year and any time of year is that Jesus came to dwell among God came to dwell among us. Emmanuel, he is here, you know, and and I, I think we miss that because we're too busy drawing our lines. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. And I, I, I quote you all of the time on 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 the idea that sometimes we draw circles so small that that we can't even stand up in it. Yeah. and that's exactly right we we get so focused on telling people that they're wrong yeah. that it's like the old saying that when you point at somebody there's three fingers pointing back at you and and that's exactly right and and we we catch ourselves in these inconsistencies and in condemning people and in in just trying to figure out who's wrong none of us are being right. (laughs) Right. And so even if we're right about when Jesus was born or when Jesus wasn't born, we're wrong in the attitude we're taking. We're wrong in the condemning approach that we're taking. We have an opportunity to share the good news with Jesus. And instead, we're trying to share bad news with people about how wrong they are. We've got to use this opportunity to share and to participate in sharing Jesus with the world. Yes. Thank you so much, Wes. This was a great discussion. I'm so glad that you joined me for it. Keep up the great work that you're doing at McDermott Road. One of the great things uh, that uh, uh, we like to do with this podcast is promote great things that that folks are doing. So, is there anything you want to you want to alert us to that's going on with you with your with the great work you're doing with Radically Christian? Just tell us tell us about that and and how we can kind of keep up with you. Oh, we, we, I appreciate that, brother. And thanks for all that you're doing here. We, we're, we're kind of taking a break with my podcast on Radically Christian, but uh, first of the year, we'll, we'll start back up with that and uh, have more, more things to, to study about. But I appreciate you and I appreciate all that you're doing, brother. Absolutely. Thank you. And you guys can, can tune in to the Radically Christian uh, podcast where you and, and it's Travis, right, that y'all talk That's about. Right. So a lot of good biblical topics. Uh, your, your podcast has taken on more of the, uh, uh, the take of looking at biblical topics, biblical questions. And I, I really like that because I think it's sorely needed. So it's a Bible study podcast. And I, right. I think that is really, really helpful. I know it's been beneficial to me. And I want to tell our viewers and listeners that if you have a question about today's podcast, you can email me at chris.mccurley at rippleoflight.com. If you have a question specifically for Wes and something that he said, then we'll make sure that he gets that email as well. And I'm sure he'd be glad to respond in any way that he can. Wes, thank you again, brother. Thank you, brother. And thank you all for tuning in. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. Sincerely, Chris.